Well, greetings, welcome in. We are so grateful that you chose this opportunity to see our First Grace morning worship celebrations together. We hope that this can be a resource for you in conjunction with belonging to and being known by a local church fellowship. By no means does this substitute that. And we pray that you, wherever you are, would be able to find that. We are so excited about the opportunity to study the scriptures together. And we hope that this can be a resource for you. If you have been blessed by the ministries of First Grace as well, you can give back at www.firstgrace.com slash online giving. And we would love to be able uh, to see that investment go forward in ministry. So God bless you. And we hope that you are edified and delight in the scriptures as we study them together today. Today, it's interesting because pregnancy is what we're going to zero in on in the beginning of this message. And I want you to hear a little bit today about how precious a life was to one lady in the scripture, someone who had been barren, someone who had not been able to have children, and her name was Hannah. If you've got your Bible with you, we need to turn to 1 Samuel, and we're going to look at chapter 1. And then we're going to continue to kind of do a little survey of the book of 1 Samuel up through the first several chapters of that book. And we're going to focus in on the life of Samuel. This is a continuation of our series called Biblical Families, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We're up to part 15, and we have zeroed in on 15 different family situations, all so far in the Old Testament, families that have been normal, regular families on many levels outside of the fact that God decided he was going to use these families. These families were not perfect, and a lot of times we kind of throw these families under the bus as, as believers. We kind of uh, sugarcoat their lives, and we kind of look at these things and these people through rose-colored glasses, and actually they were very, very normal, painfully normal. They had lots of problems. They had lots of issues. There was sin in more ways than we could possibly imagine. It's like a soap opera, even way more than a Bible story. And this life of Samuel is really not too different, and there are some lessons here that we need to look at and understand about the family that Samuel was born into and was raised into, and then eventually how he became a man who had to kind of guide his own ship through a lot of decisions in the area of family. If you've got 1 Samuel chapter 1, stand to your feet, and we're going to read God's word together, starting with verse number 9. The title of this message today is Samuel's Family Life. And it starts with a woman of faith who was his mother named Hannah. In verse 9, we read, After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She, Hannah, was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. Now we know from just looking at Samson last week that this was the Nazarite vow, setting apart a child to the Lord. Verse 12, as she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. 
Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah, this would be Hannah's husband, knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. The man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, as soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Father, we thank you for the power of your word. Such a story like this inspires us, excites us, and we see the makings of powerful destiny as we read this story. We give you praise and glory. Lord, make us people of destiny in your precious name. Amen. You can be seated. So I want to comment on this story. First of all, what we just read is one of the most powerful examples of praying for God's best and setting apart a young child even before they're born. I remember my in-laws, my wife's parents, telling thousands and tens of thousands of people as we did concerts all over the world that when they had children, they wanted to follow the example of Hannah in the Bible. They dedicated their children to the Lord even before they were born And the purpose of that was to underscore that they understood the value and the treasure of each unique life, even as they were being carried by the mother. This is important. And this is one of the reasons why we have made a stand on something as hideous as abortion in our culture, as millions of unborn lives have been sacrificed and murdered to the God of this world. And we look at this situation and it's a stark contrast to what Hannah thought the value of this child was and what God had told her about how he would be dedicated and set apart to God. As you heard in that story, she would set Samuel apart to be the prophet that God had ordained him to be. She knew There was a promise in her heart that this child that God was going to give her, and at that point, she had not even conceived yet, but she believed the promise of God, and by faith, everything God told her came true. I want you to think about that today. If God gives you a word, he doesn't mess around. If God has given you a promise, everything he has said to you is true and it will 
come to pass. God has got a big agenda. It's bigger than ours. Hannah wanted to be part of it, and she prayed. She wanted to know everything that God wanted for her life. She wanted to know that that she could be a, a contributor to the plan and purpose of God and that maybe a child that was born of her own body could miraculously serve God. And that's exactly what Samuel did. She wanted to seal the deal, clinch this whole situation in a big way. And so she promised the Lord and she told Eli that if God gave her that son and when that son would come, she would bring him to the temple and allow him to be raised in the house of the Lord. What faith, what an amazing demonstration of huge faith. This was the beginning of Samuel's life and it was a stellar beginning. A lot of times when we talk about Samuel, we hear this story and then we don't delve into the rest of the details of what happened in the rest of their their lives. Samuel's life and the other people, the ancillary people that were also part of his life. We don't really dig into those details much, but there is a big story here. And even a story that's underlying this decision and all the pain and anguish that Hannah was going through as she was just begging God for an answer, a supernatural intervention in her life. There was a lot of behind the scenes issues going on. The story of Samuel's early life is told in the Jewish scripture, and it's something that has been passed down to us. The focus of this story is not on Samuel's family, but this morning we're gonna focus a little bit more on this because we wanna know how Samuel's family kind of filled in some of the, the details of what shaped Samuel and what issues he had to potentially overcome. It's on the activities of Samuel as a judge, which he became, and on the politics of the nation of Israel and the moral condition and the moral decline of the Israelite nation that we usually focus on. These issues were not good things going on. It's no surprise then that families also were having trouble. Samuel's family that he came from were having trouble. Eli's family that he was fostered into as Eli the priest led the the temple of God it had problems. If we read carefully, we can get a picture of Samuel raised in a very much less than perfect home. I think we've come to expect this, haven't we? To find out behind the scenes, this great prophet of God that was used in the life of Israel had a way less than perfect home. And I want us to look at this situation together. If you can write a couple points down, I'm gonna give them to you today. And we're starting, number one is picture of family dysfunction. I'm gonna give you the picture. We're gonna go down through some of these first chapters of 1 Samuel, and I'm gonna paint this picture of where Samuel came from, what he was living with, what he endured, and how dysfunctional all of the family that surrounded Samuel really was. And one of the reasons is because, let's just face it today, we have hope in the midst of our imperfection. We have hope. God can intervene even when we can't find the right words or the right wisdom or the right situation to make things better on our own. God can intervene and his strength can be perfect in our struggle and in our imperfection and weakness. So we started with Hannah as we read. So let's start with Hannah. This is Samuel's mother. And as we look at this whole picture of Samuel's family dysfunction, Hannah was probably the bright spot. Everything else was pretty downhill from there. Hannah was the bright spot, and we use her as a model very often. And in this example, even that I was talking about with my wife's parents, many people have looked at Hannah and have aspired to be like her. She was Samuel's mother, but listen, she was a second wife. 
And she wasn't a second wife because Elkanah, her husband, had been through a divorce. She just was an additional wife. And for whatever reason, Elkanah, Samuel's father, had sinfully reasoned out that he needed two wives. I'm not sure why any man would just decide on his own to have two wives or any more than that. Um, I feel like one is more than enough. And of course, we also understand that it's God's standard. God said in the very beginning, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper for him, one helper. One man for one woman for life. That was God's standard. He didn't make two wives, Eve and her friend for Adam. He just created Eve. And he gave us this picture that this is what marriage and family and a husband and wife coming together should look like. It wasn't until Cain came in the picture. And you know Cain who was the one who murdered his brother and somehow tried to justify all of that because somehow God didn't take my sacrifice. I gave him the best fruits and vegetables I had. Well, Cain sinned. He didn't obey God and he was on a wrong path and he was the one who decided he needed multiple wives down the road. And so through the sinful family of Cain, this practice of multiple wives entered the picture and it took a long time for things to get back to the pure standard of God. And he said from the very beginning that the standard that he had created was one man for one woman for life. Elkanah evidently in his study of the word and his devout Judaism did not get the memo on God's standard. So here he has these two wives, and as you might guess, they fight. They've got rivalry, they've got jealousy. The first wife, whose name was Peniel, she was able to bear children, and she never let Hannah hear the end of it. Hannah was continually irritated by her, was continually being prodded and poked and teased and made fun of. And of course, in that day, if you could not have children, as we've talked about with somebody like Rachel and Jacob, Rachel was not able to have children. Leah was. Rachel was feeling like an outcast. She felt inferior. She was insecure. And they would say that the blessing of God was not on her life because she was not bearing children. Well, that was not necessarily true. And in God's time, she did have children. But the same was true with Hannah. And she was enduring all kinds of belittling and all kinds of mockery from this second wife of Elkanah. Elkanah tried to help the situation, but the best thing he could have done in the first place was never marry that other woman. Needless to say, there was strife and there was tension in the home. Paniah had three children. She became became Hannah's chief rival. So the Bible says in 1 Samuel 1, verse 6 through 8, that her rival, this is talking about Peniel, used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb, talking about Hannah. So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Can you imagine that going to church? And every time you you walk into church, you're gonna get provoked by a woman that's close to you. Hannah endured all of the ignominy and all of the strife. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. She went on a hunger strike, she was so upset. So here's what Samuel was effectively born into. So there was his mother, who was a woman of faith and an evil stepmother who loved to irritate and and make fun of people in the family. She was a thorn in the family's flesh. And this is the family that Samuel was born into with a father who made less than stellar choices. 
who decided that one wife wasn't enough and he had to have two, and here come all the problems. So lots of problems, lots of wrong decisions, lots of allowance for things that God never said were okay. So because Hannah, Samuel's mother, had made this promise to God, she gave up her custody of Samuel at a young age. And I'm sure that Hannah was thinking, well, I don't want my son to be raised around that woman. Peniel. See, I've told you it sounds just like a soap opera, doesn't it? I don't want my son to be around those people. I don't want my son to be shaped by that woman. I don't want my son to have to watch the example of his sinful, lascivious father. So she made arrangements that she would give up her custody of Samuel at a young age. She left him at the tabernacle to be raised by the priest whose name was Eli. And we can read about this in 1 Samuel 1, verse 24. It says, when she had weaned Samuel, she took him up with her along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, as we read. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh, and the child was young. Emphasis on young. Hannah decided to relinquish custody of Samuel, and she brought him up and left him on the doorstep of the temple with Eli with a sacrifice and some food. And we read about this in 1 Samuel 1, verse 24, that when Hannah had weaned him, she took him up with her along with the three-year-old bull, and here's the sacrifice. So he was young. He had just stopped nursing, and we're thinking about three years old. She takes him to the steps of the temple and says, here you go, Eli. I'm trusting you with my son. She had also prayed and she had talked to God about this. And she had done it in advance and said, if you give me a son, if you bless my life, I will give him back to you. I'm sure the Lord knew what that meant. I'm not sure Eli knew. But he got the child and the child Samuel was left there for him at the temple. Well, you might say, what a wonderful thing for Samuel to be left with the, with the pastor, with the priest. What a wonderful way for that child to grow up. Well, unfortunately, Eli's family had issues. Eli had his own sons and his sons were wicked men. And as we go on with the soap opera of this situation, we find out that these sons that Eli had quote unquote raised, he obviously had not given them the attention that they needed or the instruction that they needed. We see that he was actually a, a good functioning priest for the nation, but he neglected his own sons and they were running wild. They were full of wickedness. They were full of debauchery. They were bringing shame on Eli. They brought a curse on the family of Eli. And this is the family that now has custody of Samuel. So Eli's family had these issues. The sons had no regard for the Lord. They wanted nothing to do with godly things. We read about this in 1 Samuel 2, verse 12, and then down in 17. It says, now the sons of Eli were worthless men. That's saying a mouthful right there. Not only were they worthless, but they were full of themselves and they were full of wickedness. They did not know the Lord. Thus, the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. In other words, they didn't just not believe God, they made a mockery of things that were godly. They talked to people and stole from people and were involved in things like temple prostitution and stealing of sacrifice money and all kinds of things. These were the sons and the family of Eli. Doesn't say anything about who Eli's wife was, but the burden of responsibility was on Eli. And he was the one who was supposed to shape Samuel and his own sons were full of themselves and a problem to the nation. Eli told his boys to stop, but he took no steps to ensure that they obeyed. 
He was just so easygoing. He's what we would call an enabler. Instead of a disciplinarian, he enabled all of their bad behavior to just continue. It was a curse on everybody. And you've heard me say this many, many times. If you decide not to discipline your children and to shape them in a path that they should go on, they will be a curse to everyone throughout their life. Discipline them, love them, show them God's path, and they'll be a blessing to everyone for their whole life. And this is underscored by the scriptural principle, train up a child in the way that they should go. It doesn't say to take your hands off of them and say, well, my job is done. You're all grown now. Nope. Train up a child in the way that they should go. When they're older, they'll stay on the path. They'll not depart from that path. It's important, Eli didn't do it. He told the boys to stop, but he never ever gave them any accountability to ensure that they would obey. He was so easygoing and the consequences were never severe. They resulted not just in their own judgment, but in a curse on the whole family so that the entire family, they, both of these men, they died young because of their wicked lives. In 1 Samuel 3, verse 13, it says, I declare to, to him, God is, is saying, and he's giving this word to Samuel about Eli's family. I declare to him that I'm about to punish his house forever, says God. For the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Yow. Very seldom do you see a judgment like this coming from God because God is full of grace. He's full of mercy. He's loving. His character is completely loving. The blasphemy and the disregard of everything that was sacred and godly in the nation of Israel by these wicked sons of Eli was so huge. God said, don't bother sacrificing or coming with your apologies. You will never be forgiven. Whew. And here is little Samuel growing up in this. And God gave him that prophetic word to tell Eli that God was cursing his family. You think that was hard? Talk about trauma that you'll have to go to a therapist for the rest of your life. Samuel was probably a basket case understanding these things and realizing that God was making him a mouthpiece, not only for blessing of a nation, but the curse of somebody that has taken him in as a foster child. This was Eli. Well, 1 Samuel 4, 16 and 18 talks about the way that this curse was carried out. And it says, the man said to Eli, am I he who comes from the battle? I fled from the battle today. And Eli said, how did it go, my son? He who brought the news answered and said, Israel has fled from the Philistines and there has also been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas are dead and the ark of God has been captured. When Eli heard this, as soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of the gate and his neck was broken and he died. For the man was old and heavy. He had judged Israel 40 years. How huge. In one day, Samuel's entire foster family died. So talk about a burden for a kid to carry. This is Samuel. Hannah thought, 
well, I'm giving custody of my God-given treasure, this little boy, Samuel, to a, to a great family. And they're going to foster him. They're going to take him in. He's going to learn at the feet of Eli. And I'm sure he learned some great things. But in this one day, Samuel's entire foster family died. Huge. How does a young boy snap back from that? How do you recover from those kinds of losses? What happens when not only do the people that you care about and the people you've been raised with, when they all walk away from you, but when they walk away to a life of wickedness and God wipes them off the face of the planet? Job 4, verse 8 says, As I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same, says Job. That whole principle of sowing and reaping, boy, it's a hard thing. But it's true. When we were driving with Grace folks up to Osgood to go out to dinner on Friday night, we were driving through some of the most beautiful farm country. And all I could think of as we were going through that beautiful farm country is all the work that farmers put in to make that happen. The beauty of the crops that were tall, the corn was up to your eye and you had all kinds of soybeans and crops on both sides. It was just beautiful and pure and pristine, you know, nice country air. It was just gorgeous on so many levels. And I just kept thinking, you know, a farmer went out and worked and sowed that crop so that we could experience what we were seeing as we drove up through there and then he's gonna have a harvest. What you sow, you reap. That's why it's so important what you're sowing. And in lives, it's so important that we sow truth, that we sow God's word, that we sow valuable moral principles, valuable lifestyle that honors Jesus Christ. Galatians 6 verse seven says, don't be deceived. Don't think you can get around this. God is not mocked for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Unfortunately, that was the story of Eli. So I'm gonna run this down for you. This is all under number one, the picture of a dysfunctional family. So in other words, Samuel's whole foster family died ugly deaths, wild, crazy deaths in one day. And I want us to recap the list of dysfunction that Samuel was dealing with. Here's Samuel. He's God's appointed prophet and judge over Israel. And here's what he had to deal with. His father had two wives at the same time. His stepmother was mean-spirited, and that's putting it mildly. He was made into a foster child at about three years old, Samuel's foster brothers were selfish and corrupt and full of wickedness. His father, Eli, the foster father, was lenient in the moral training of his two biological sons. And at the end, the whole foster family died in a single day. And this is what a young boy who's anointed by God as a Nazarite and set apart had to deal with. So if there are some of us who think that we've got it bad, look at Samuel. And all of a sudden, you're going to get some perspective. Even though things could be really bad, and you might be going through what you think is the valley of the shadow of death, the worst of the worst of the worst, and you think, God, I can't handle any more. Could things get any worse than they are right now? I've been hurt, I've been abandoned. My family's dysfunctional. Nothing is working out the way I expected. Well, look at Samuel's life and take heart. God had a plan. And I'll tell you what overcame for Samuel. And this is number two. Prayer changed things. Prayer. Prayer changed things. There was a little saying that went around for many, many years that just said prayer changes things. In this story, it did change things. In your situation, prayer will change things. 
And maybe it's a little too simplistic for you. Or maybe it's just something that you just don't wanna devote yourself to. Or maybe it's something that you just don't think you've got time for. Or maybe you're distracted by so many other things that you just can't bring yourself to focus in on something as hugely profitable as prayer. Maybe you think you have to be in a church. Maybe you think you've gotta be in a right attitude. Maybe you think that circumstances have gotta be at least moving in a good direction for you to pray. No, this was not the case. In Samuel's story, Hannah was in the worst distress of her life. This is one of the reasons why we encourage people to pray when they're well. We encourage people to pray when they're sick. We encourage people to pray when their families are going well and they see good things happening. We encourage people to pray when families are upside down and full of trouble. When you've got a job, when you don't have a job. When you feel strong, when you feel weak. In everything, we give thanks through prayer and we petition God because God says prayer changes things. Bring God in. Let God come into your situation. When you've prayed, pray some more. When you've prayed some more, pray even more. Pray, 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 and then pray. God says never, ever give up praying. Pray without ceasing. In 1 Samuel 2, verse 1, Hannah prayed. And I'll just say that this is the reason. She was the bright spot. Even though she was insecure, she was beaten down, she was abused, she had all kinds of issues, Hannah prayed. And she's one of the only people in the family that we have a record of praying. She prayed. And she said, my heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation, God. She was willing to take her burdens to the Lord. And she didn't pick them up again. She laid them there. She prayed. That entire second chapter of 1 Samuel is about Hannah's prayer and how she prayed diligently to the Lord. If you think you've done enough praying for your family, for your children, for your marriage, for all the things that concern your life, you haven't even begun. Pray, pray, pray. 1 Samuel 12, 23. Evidently, this truth was passed on. I don't know if Eli taught Samuel more about this, or whether he saw the example of his mother. But I do know that more is caught than taught. Our children will do what they see and not necessarily what you say. Samuel was a man of prayer. He was set apart by God, but he evidently had seen an example and he was a man of prayer. In 1 Samuel 12, 23, it says, moreover, as for me, Far be it from me that I should be sinning against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. And I will instruct you in the good and the right way. And the way we instruct in the good and the right way is with an example of praying. Praying is always the right thing to do. So one of the things that Brenda and I decided a long time ago about our family, about relationships, we decided we want to do the right thing before God. Whatever that's gonna be, and it might be hard to do it at times, but we want to do the right thing before God. Can I just say, the right thing is always to pray. Pray. Pray on your own, pray together, intercede. Prayer changes things. James 5, verse 16 says, pray for one another that you might be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. As you're praying, understand by faith, God is moving the machinery of heaven on your behalf. And we've talked about this at prayer initiatives and times when we've had prayer rallies. Prayer is the oil of the machinery of heaven. You pray and the machines of heaven move in the power of God on your behalf. 
It's a powerful, powerful reality. Ephesians 6, verse 18 says, pray at all times in the spirit. Pray, not just saying a bunch of words, but from the depth of your heart, from the depth of your spirit, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 says sometimes when we don't know how to pray, the, the spirit prays for us, interceding, groaning in ways that our spirit groans. It says, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And can I just say, we need to be alert about what's going on in our nation. We need to pray for our nation. Be aware of what's going on in your family, your children's lives. Pray for those things specifically. Pray. The last thing is purpose to be a priest. So here are two things that worked in the life of Samuel. Not perfectly and not in every area as we're gonna see here. But primarily the reason Samuel was able to be the prophet and the judge and the man of God that he was for Israel was because these two things were active at least in some part in his life. As he judged the nation of Israel, as he helped them and pointed them toward God, this is one of the things. Number three is purpose to be a priest. Purpose to be a priest. And it went really well with the alliteration with the, the use of the letter P, purpose to be a priest. But you can call yourself what you want to, a minister of the gospel, a godly man, a godly woman. Purpose to be what God has destined you to be. And the reason I use the word priest is because we're called a kingdom of priests in the scripture. Samuel understood that he was set apart to be a priest. 1 Samuel 3, verse 1, it says, the boy, not full-grown man, but the boy, Samuel, was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. Samuel was just a boy, and he was ministering. This is one of the reasons why we let our children come into ministry with us and pray with people at altars from the time that they were little children because they did understand the fact that if you prayed, you could see powerful things happen. Obviously, just because we pray doesn't mean that God waves a magic wand and our life is perfect. But we did understand and we understood as a family and I think our children understood that prayer accomplished something. Samuel understood, and as he was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. And can I just say, this is also symptomatic of our nation, our country, our culture right now. It's rare that you're seeing the word of the Lord spoken over the nation. It's rare that you're, you're gonna hear in a public square the reading of the word anymore. And as I talked about it just a few minutes ago, you know, in the 60s and 70s, we had those despicable rulings like Roe versus Wade. And at the same time, we took Bible reading, prayer, any mention of God, any honoring even of our, our American flag out of the classroom, out of the schools. And it hasn't been until just recently that there's even any opening or even a possibility that there could be a, a chink in that wall that has been erected to keep God out. I'm grateful that for what's happening here in Vandalia Butler, but it's not the norm. It's rare in these days that the word of the Lord comes and there's very little vision for godly things. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. 
Samuel somehow came to the conclusion, maybe what he saw in Eli's family, maybe he saw in the family he grew up in. We find out as we read this text a little further down that Samuel's own sons, God blessed him with sons, and his sons went wayward. Maybe he saw too much of the example of Eli and his own sons wound up going the same direction as Eli's sons had. So in some way, Samuel was a victim of the training that he saw and the dysfunction that was all around him. But even with that, God used him still. Now, this was really an encouragement to me. And I'm not telling you that my children have all gone wicked. (laughs) But it was an encouragement to me because it really doesn't matter at this point where they go and what they do. God has a plan for my life. And I know his calling is on my life. And I know that I did whatever I could do to put them on a right path. But as a young adult, as young families, they make their own decisions and they stand before God one day. Samuel was not gonna stand before God on behalf of his sons, but he was gonna stand before God on behalf of his own life. And he said, obedience is more important than anything you sacrifice. So take the burden off your shoulders, parents. This is not something you should be carrying. And I know a lot of us, as we see our children making sketchy decisions and things that we would not agree with or things that we wouldn't think the church would would be agreeing to, we, we look at these situations and all of a sudden we start feeling guilty. We take this burden on ourselves and say, well, if I had done this and if I had done that and, you know, we wish we could go back and have a do-over and, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, and you, you hear all these things said. But listen, friends, God doesn't have any grandchildren. He's interested in your life. Your children will have to stand before God on their own. Samuel had to. His sons had to. Eli had to. His sons had to. But there's something in all of this that we need to learn. Revelation 1, verse 5 and 6 says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him, Jesus, who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, he has made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. The reason I read that is because as we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, he tells us we are ministering ambassadors for him. A kingdom of priests. Yeah, it's a burden, but it's more of a responsibility than it is a burden. Jesus said his yoke is easy and his burden is light. It's really not a burden as much as it is just a huge responsibility. Yes, we're responsible for what we do, for how we live. It's important that we be prayer warriors. We're important to God. We're important to those that we're shaping. And it's important what we give them. The word of God, the example of a believer, all of these things are huge. Why? Because God has called us to be ministers of his. Ministers, priests. So when Samuel became an adult, the people came to him with many, many, many of their problems. I'm sure Samuel looked at them and said, hey, (laughs) you haven't gone through anything. You ought to hear about my life. You ought to hear about my life. And I've talked with some of you through the years and seen how you've had to deal with things and things that were difficult, things that were painful, things were hard to overcome, situations you would have never, ever chosen. God's faithful. He's got a calling on your life. It matters how you live. It really, really matters. Samuel rose to that challenge. Even though he had problems in the family that he grew up in and then the family that he 
raised up himself, his own sons. Samuel got the memo on this. He led the people of Israel in a process of cleansing their homes. Listen, of bad spiritual influence and turning to God instead. Just like I've talked about so many times here and I've said, you know, we, we don't think that we're afflicted with idols in the U.S., but yet we really are. There are a lot of things out there, a lot of idols that will distract us, that will take our attention away from what's godly, that will take our attention away from the priorities that God has for our lives. And we've got to gain the spiritual influence that God has given to us through prayer, and then we've got to turn and repent. Repentance is not a bad word. It's a word that brings new beginning. It's really nothing more than recognizing a bad thing in your life, turning from it, and embracing something better, something godly. So instead of just saying, well, I'm putting off that bad habit, I'm turning off that, that bad thought, I'm gonna turn away from those bad lifestyle choices that I've made, and Instead of just doing that, which is great, you turn and you say, God, I'm embracing you. I'm embracing a new life, a new pattern, a pattern that's full of prayer, a pattern that's full of godly example, all of the things that you want for me. And in our lives, we take in all kinds of things that are wrong, bad for us. This is a way to turn that whole thing around. Turn the tables on harmful addictions. Turn and repent from something like laziness. And you know what I'm talking about when I say laziness. All those people during COVID that decided, you know, I can get money from the government. I don't have to work. Well, that might be a nice carnal mindset to pad your pocketbook, but it's not gonna last forever and God will not honor laziness. Turn away from it. Turn away from negative attitudes about people. Turn away from the neglect of your spiritual life with God. Start going to Bible study on Monday nights. I'm telling you, the women that go to Bible study, man, they're gonna be the powerhouse of this church eventually. Learning and growing and maturing in Christ. The young men and the older men that have come to Bible study on Monday night, they're, they're growing deeper and they're going to be better godly men real resources that God can use. These things have got to be bolstered in our lives. And sometimes it takes hard work and even help from others. Don't be afraid to look for resources in the body of Christ. Bad things have to be cleaned out and then a path open for relationship with God if we really want to experience the healing that Samuel had. Samuel arose from a horrible family situation but he did. Finding healing like Samuel's means turning from sin and then turning to God. So now we read this book and we see Samuel as a great man. We love these stories, but just like us, Samuel was successful in some ways and he failed in other ways. He was a great leader, but he could have done so much more he could have been so much better as a family man himself. And I, I don't know all the details of this, but we do know that he lost his sons in the process of trying to shape Israel. This is a note of hope for all of us. The fact that you are here today is an indication that you want more. You're concerned about your family life. And as we've done this series and we've talked about biblical families, you know, I love your feedback and I love to hear from people who say, listen, I was really encouraged by that story. I, I had never ever thought of so many of those things and I realize that God has a plan for my family. It helps us. Perhaps you find it easier to attain success in other ways in your life. It's hard, it's not for cowards. It's good to have success in other areas, but now, it's time to look deep within our own hearts, 
to look at the elements that made Samuel successful and then apply those things for the win. In the end, God wants to know that we've been faithful. What did we do as we struggled? If we turn to him, he promises to welcome us home and say, well done. You did good, kid. You were great. I loved watching you and I loved hearing from you all the times that you turned to me. Maybe your family today, it may be your spiritual life, could be your work life, could be in areas of your finances. Lots and lots of things it could be. But Samuel shows us how to train the best things. The prayer, the example, the desire for God's best as we're priests in his ministry. He shows us how to have success.